Good day, my friends. Here we are again. You all remembered to come back to class. <laughs> you are learning so much about Alzheimer's disease. More specifically, you're learning a lot about the effect of menopause on your risk for Alzheimer's disease. This is an education that all women deserve. That's why I deliver it here on YouTube in a manner that all women can access. We're in the midst of our unit on Alzheimer's, and this is the 16th Alzheimer's video, and we're not even quite halfway through the unit. <laughs> we're addressing the details of some of the strongest risk factors for Alzheimer's. In videos 246 and 247, I addressed age, which is the strongest risk factor of all. Then in video 248, I talked about genetics. Next, we turned our attention to your female hormones. And so far we've discussed two aspects of your female hormones on Alzheimer's. In video 249, we looked at the effect of estrogen and progesterone on your brain. And in video 250, we looked at the effect of loss of estrogen and progesterone on your brain. I like to come at things from every angle. That helps you see the logic behind the facts. So the next logical thing to do is to look at the effect of different types of menopause on your risk for Alzheimer's. And that's what we'll do in this video. The Alzheimer chapter in my book is chapter 33, and you'll find this information there in a much less detailed format. Now, why is this video important? Well, it's because if loss of estrogen at postmenopause increases your risk of Alzheimer's, then the timing and the manner in which you experience postmenopause and loss of your estrogen will make a difference in your risk of Alzheimer's. And knowing that it makes a difference in your risk for Alzheimer's can better equip you with the tools to avoid it. So let's start by acknowledging the fact that estrogen loss is a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. Way back in video 245, I presented all the risk factors for Alzheimer's. We created a great big chart of them. Here's that chart again. If you look at the first item in the modifiable category, you see estrogen deficiency. It's in a blush, almost beige color. Well, estrogen deficiency is precisely what postmenopause is. So today, we want to consider the different ways in which you can become estrogen deficient. And we want to see if they have any bearing on your risk for Alzheimer's. Ages ago, I taught you that you can become postmenopausal in a variety of ways. But regardless of what causes you to lose your estrogen, Postmenopause has two broad categories that define its type. And both categories have to do with timing. The first one has to do with the age at which you become postmenopausal. And the second has to do with how long it takes for you to become postmenopausal. From previous videos, you know that the age at which you become postmenopausal designates whether you are prematurely postmenopausal or non-prematurely postmenopausal. And the length of time it takes you to become postmenopausal designates whether your postmenopause comes about gradually or suddenly. So we're going to look at all these different ways in which your postmenopause can come about and correlate each with your risk for Alzheimer's. If your Alzheimer's risk changes from one to the other, then estrogen loss has a whole lot to do with causing Alzheimer's. And if your Alzheimer's risk is unaffected by these different types of postmenopause, then estrogen loss has very little to do with causing Alzheimer's. Logical, isn't it? start with the age at which you become postmenopausal. In video 134, I taught you all about something called premature menopause. In that video, you learned that premature menopause 
is postmenopause that occurs earlier than it should based on the average age of menopause. Notice that it only refers to postmenopause. So we'll divide menopause into premature menopause and non premature menopause. The average age for non premature menopause is 51. That means there's a normal range for when most women lose their estrogen and become postmenopausal. It's a lot like determining the average age of puberty. If age 12 is average, then the normal range is between about 10 and 14. But age 8 is premature puberty, also known as precocious puberty. We don't have an analogous term of precocious menopause for premature menopause. But if age 51 is average, then non-premature postmenopause ranges from about ages 46 to 56. Premature menopause is when you become postmenopausal at or before the age of 45. Now you know that estrogen was like your body's fountain of youth. That's why you feel so young and sexy before you lose it, and it's also why you associate menopause with aging. Because when you lose your estrogen, your body starts aging rapidly both inside and out. In the unit on osteoporosis, you learn that estrogen loss equals bone loss. Bone loss is a form of aging for your bones. And in this unit, you've learned that brain loss is a form of aging, aging for your brain. You see how certain principles hold true regardless of the specifics? Likewise, in the unison, unit on osteoporosis, you learn that the earlier you lose your estrogen, the earlier you start losing bone. And the more bone you lose, the higher your risk for fractures. So we need to address whether this, these same principles hold true with regard to your brain and Alzheimer's. What's your guess? Do you think losing your estrogen prematurely affects your risk of Alzheimer's? Absolutely, of course it does. It really wouldn't make sense for it not to. Take a look at this graph. It's similar to one you saw in video 134 on premature menopause. Along the horizontal x-axis, you see ages from 40 to 90. The colored lines represent the age at which you become postmenopausal. The blue line indicates postmenopause beginning at age 40. The orange line indicates postmenopause beginning at age 45. The gray line indicates postmenopause beginning at age 50. And the yellow line indicates postmenopause beginning at age 55. The colored lines rise with your degree of risk for Alzheimer's associated with menopause. And as you can see, they show how quickly your risk for Alzheimer's increases depending on how early you become postmenopausal. If you become prematurely menopausal at age 40, your risk for Alzheimer's is, is already eight times higher than normal by the time you're 50. And if you become prematurely menopausal at age 45, your risk is still six times higher by the time you're 50. So the earlier you become postmenopausal, the higher your risk for Alzheimer's. The later you become postmenopausal, the lower your risk for Alzheimer's. So even though age and estrogen loss are independent risk factors for Alzheimer's, the combination of the two matters a lot in determining your risk. What about the time frame over which you lose your estrogen? Some women endure perimenopause for 10 years. That means for 10 years, their progesterone is low or gone and their estrogen is wacko. Other women endure perimenopause for about two years. That's the most common scenario. And still other women have no perimenopause at all. Their estrogen loss is sudden. This can happen as a result of surgery that removes both of your ovaries, or chemotherapy that destroys your ovaries, or radiation therapy that destroys your ovaries. In those situations, you go instantly 
from having plenty of estrogen to having none. Poof! Do you think there's any difference in these two scenarios with regard to their impact on your risk of Alzheimer's disease? Well, of course there is. Think about it in terms of aging. Do you think your body handles gradual aging and sudden aging equally? Gradual aging allows your body time to acclimate to the aging process. It gives you time to compensate for some of the consequences of aging. You may even be able to slow the, slow the process down, but sudden aging doesn't allow for any of that. This entire education on menopause is about all the different ways you can compensate for estrogen deficiency. And that's easier to do if the deficiency comes about in a gradual manner, no matter what the topic at hand. So when you lose your estrogen gradually, the brain cells bearing estrogen receptors start noticing that they don't get as much estrogen as they used to. To compensate, they may try to adjust their expectations. They may make modifications that enable them to function nearly as well with less. And the longer they do that, the better they may get at doing that. But when brain cells that are used to having plenty of estrogen suddenly have none, they have no time to accommodate to its absence. It's a state of shock for your brain. It's like sudden starvation. So if you look at that graph again and change the specifics, you see that the general pattern is the same. Now you see different parameters along the horizontal x-axis. I've designated estrogen loss suddenly as demonstrated by the blue line. Estrogen loss over two years as demonstrated by the orange line. Estrogen loss over five years as demonstrated by the gray line. And estrogen loss over 10 years as demonstrated by the yellow line. And once again, you see that there is a difference in how early and how rapidly your risk for Alzheimer's increases, depending on the length of time frame for your estrogen loss. The more suddenly you lose your estrogen, the higher your risk of Alzheimer's. And the more slowly you lose your estrogen, the lower your risk for Alzheimer's. Obviously, all menopausal experiences will be a combination of the two broad categories of these types of menopause. All women will have either premature or non-premature menopause. And all women will have either sudden or gradual menopause. The combination of the two greatly affects the risk for Alzheimer's disease. If you were to list them in decreasing order with regard to your risk of Alzheimer's, the list would look like this. First would be non-premature gradual menopause, then non-premature sudden menopause, followed by premature gradual menopause, and finally premature sudden menopause. And if we were to make a chart to demonstrate this, it would look like this. This simple chart is color-coded to reflect the degree of increased risk for Alzheimer's disease for each type of menopause. The lighter the color, the lower the risk. In the first lightest cell, you see non-premature gradual menopause, which has the lowest risk. Below that, you see non-premature sudden menopause, which has an intermediate level of risk. In the next column, you see premature gradual menopause in a darker color indicating higher risk. And in the last cell for premature sudden menopause, the color is very dark, indicating very high risk. Quite commonly, premature menopause and sudden menopause occur together. And when they do, the effect on your increased risk for Alzheimer's is doubled. They both increase your risk significantly. Now, Obviously, you don't typically have control over when or how you lose your estrogen. The key is to understand that these things do make a difference in your risk for Alzheimer's. It is never, ever my goal to scare you. I'm not one of those people who uses fear to induce you to act in some way. In fact, I don't care how you manage your menopause. All I care about is that you know what you're doing. Fear does not help you. Education and facts do. 
So what you've learned here today is that while estrogen loss increases your risk for Alzheimer's, when and how quickly that estrogen loss occurs affects your risk too. This is all consistent with what I taught you last week about your lifetime estrogen exposure impacting your risk for Alzheimer's. The bottom line is that the longer you have estrogen in your body, the lower your risk for Alzheimer's. And the higher the levels of estrogen, the lower your risk for Alzheimer's. And the reason it's important to know this is because there are many management options that can lower your risk for Alzheimer's. And you might be able to use those management options to offset premature menopause or sudden menopause. We'll be getting to the videos that present all your management options in just two weeks. I'll give you separate videos for each category of options, just like I did in the units on heart attack and osteoporosis. And you can utilize that information as a tool to decrease your risk. Next week, I'll present the research studies on Alzheimer's disease and HRT. As usual, research studies are always fraught with controversy, so I like to give you the big picture that includes all the studies and let you decide for yourself how it all applies to you personally. So, I will bid you goodbye for now. If you want me to help you with anything, anything at all, anything about applying menopause specifically to you, just schedule a consultation with me at menopausetaylor.me. If you haven't already subscribed to this channel, be sure to do so and force all your friends to do the same. <laughs> you can also follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you use those. And I'll see you in a week. Bye. <laughs>